So, as you've all heard by now, I'm Bianca. And what I want to use this presentation for is really just to set the context for this workshop, because I'll speak again this afternoon, and this will be the time when I'll give you more details about all those different aspects. So this really is about um, what Sue already said. Um, well, there's maternity protection, there's all this regulation, but what does that actually mean in practice? So maybe we can start by asking why employers should care about providing maternity protection in the workplace. Are there any ideas here in the room? What do you think? Any volunteers? Social justice. Social justice, so an important point that Sue's already made. Anything else? Keep employees within the company. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Keep the employees within the company. Okay, retaining staff within the organization. Yes, staff motivation, retention, very often mentioned. Yeah? Legal compliance. Yeah, okay. Because people are right. working on their own rights. Okay. Right. So when um, Sue and I did this um, review, international literature review for the International Labour Organization, the focus was on small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, we were actually really surprised how little literature we could find specifically on the subject. There was a lot on family-friendly measures, there was a lot on work-life balance, but on maternity protection specifically, there was barely anything there, and what we found was focused on large firms. We thought this was amazing, given the fact that most workers, female workers, become parents at some stage in their working lives, obviously fathers too, but it's the many, you know, during their working lives, it's the mothers, at some stage, have babies. So it's not a marginal issue. So we were really surprised. We thought this should be a mainstream issue for managing a business of any size. <laughs> um, it's also important that you know, maternity protection is not just about women. And there are some countries that are more advanced and you know, where you find more literature, obviously, particularly in Scandinavian countries. But it's a body of literature that is growing. And we also find it important to point out that um, if you find the you know, efficient ways of managing maternity in the workplace, these can also be used to, um, in other areas of staff management, as for example, you know, to cover for sickness absence and your leave cover, other forms of cover. And also to just, if more people work part-time, it's about, you know, um, managing of a flexible workforce. So what, it is, what is maternity protection? Well, it's the International Labour Organization that's been the key player in really setting the agenda on this um, topic. And they've been very active for the past really almost century in putting this on the agenda globally. And these are the different, if you take the definition provided by the International Labour Organization, this is what is involved. So you've got maternity leave, sometimes paid, sometimes not. You've got the health protection, employment protection, breastfeeding support, child care arrangements after the return to work. So there are also some countries where you wouldn't have any um, legal requirements on breastfeeding support and child care arrangements. And this is where the family friendly policies come in, because those are the ones that um, are about provisions beyond legal um, entitlements. So, yes, by now most countries really have set minimum standards on you know what is required by uh, by businesses. Um, but it is actually very interesting to see that there's this vast difference, not just between countries, but also within countries, different regions. And it's these nuances that I'm particularly interested in and passionate about. And there's the big however, because globally most women are out of reach of this regulation, because most, well, most workers who benefit from this work in the, uh, in the formal economy. And um, yeah, you have all those studies that compare you know, regulation in different countries. But this is where I think we need to be so careful, because very often what they tell us 
about you know what is available in different countries is not really um, reflecting reality. Because yes, particularly in low-income countries, employment can mainly be found in the informal economy, and that very often operates beyond the reach of employment regulation. So employment re regulation is not being enforced, and. That means by, um, that's an estimation by a recent report by the International Labour Organization that 830 million workers in the world are not entitled to adequate protection. And most of these workers are based in Africa and Asia. And it's also the countries with the highest rates of maternal, mortal, maternal mortality that at least 80% of workers operate in the informal economy. So, yeah, as I said, in these countries, what is provided to workers mostly depends on cultural norms and expectations. And I just want to give you a few examples so that you can see what is not. I don't know if you can still hear me if I'm walk, walking away from the microphone, but I prefer to walk there's around. A, uh, mic, there's, a, there's a mobile mic. Thing, yeah, here on this table. Oh, ah, that's switched on. Okay. No? no? Yes, okay. So I'm just going to give you a few examples. Because what is also very important as part of this, it's not just about, you know, you, you always find those very nice neat tables, how many weeks of paid maternity leave do you get in a country, or, and sometimes it sounds great, but what is very important is actually who pays. So in some countries, um, you can probably not see that from the back, can you? Uh, maternity leave um, is covered by the state, it's state funded. Sometimes it's a mixed scheme where employers contribute and the state contributes. And then there are quite a few countries, and very often particularly in countries where um, you have a lot of workers in the informal economy, where it is the employer um, who takes the key burden and who's responsible for maternity leave payments. So what that means is, i just take an example. Um, as I did the research in Ghana um, recently, um, there you have 12 weeks of paid maternity leave, and that sounds better than many other countries, as to paying in the same league. Um, paid at 100% of previous earnings, sounds great, but then it's supposed to be fully paid by the employer, and this is where the problems come in, because 86% uh, of the workforce operate in the informal economy, and most firms are small or micro-sized. So that means who qualifies? It's a very small minority of the population there. And even those small firms who would like to pay simply can't afford it. So they find other ways of doing this. For example, if they have a valued number of staff, they might say, right, okay, what I can pay you to retain you is maybe three months of half pay. Or, so they come up with solutions to try. And, and just, but just you know, to show that you know, this doesn't really give you a clear picture of reality. And it's um, very similar, Brazil, 100% of previous earnings, even 17 weeks, not just 12 weeks as in um, Ghana, and fully social security paid. Yeah, but once again, yeah, it's great if the state funds it, but if most of the workers, as in Brazil as well, more than 80% of all workers work in the informal economy, they won't benefit from this. So I'm just showing this to you to see you find this a lot. You Google maternity protection and you get neat tables which tell you what's available where, but that actually does not quite reflect reality. And this is what this workshop is supposed to be about, and about unpicking this a little bit more. And this is where, you know, Sue said, we have so much, you know, quantitative research on the subject, but what does it actually tell us? And I think we are all here to see, you know, un learn and unpick this a little bit more. Um, well, actually, I think I'll, I'll stick with this. This one again, yes. Um, yeah, there are two recent reports that I'd like to draw your attention to because they are both available on the internet. The first one is the one by the International Labour Organization. I've got both of them here, so if any of you want to have a look at them. Yeah, it's in your uh, bag in the USB. <coughs> oh, so you all have a soft copy yeah. on the stick. That's perfect. Thank you very much. 
so the first one, that's the International Labour Organization, was um, um, authored by Laura Adati and colleagues. And that gives an overview of what is available, where, provides those nice tables, but is also critical about what they tell you. And the other one is the one that um, Lillian has already mentioned, that was authored by um, Sue, Lillian, myself, and also um, Julia Rowles, another UK colleague. Um, this is the one that's focused on um, SMEs, but it's also looking at firms generally. So this is really an international review on the literature currently available um, on the subject. And yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm going to be quite brief in this presentation because I'll be speaking again this afternoon. And I just want to give you an example of those layers of context that Sue mentioned earlier, just so that you get an idea of what it is that we are talking about here. Um, what we found in, I'm giving an example from Ghana again, because this is where, um, yeah, we found this. Um, I was talking to people in um, large firms, multinational corporations, but also, you know, informal workers, market workers, um, I went to very poor rural areas to do the research, and what I found was obviously very different. Um, and when going to multinational corporations, what you could find was that, uh, well, great, you know, employees were adhering to the law. Um, you very often, uh, you know, staff entitlement went beyond legal entitlement, so they were providing more, um, which was actually very nice for the image of the organization. Uh, so, on paper, that sounded great. And as I said earlier, no small firms, very often they just simply could not afford to pay 100% of previous earnings as maternity leave for three months. But we could have stopped there and said, well, this is what we found, but this is where I thought it became very interesting. But what we saw it was that those workers in the large firms, they were not satisfied because what they saw was that what was provided did not necessarily meet their needs. Because what was provided was provided to adhere to the law, but not looking at their needs in terms of managing work and family. So um, I'll give you an example of this later. So they were actually quite dissatisfied with what was going on. Whereas in smaller firms, as I said, very often the employers were struggling with providing, you know, minimum uh, requirements, you know, required by the law. But they were much better at providing family-friendly practices, allowing staff to bring their children to work. But in the large firms, it was very sterile environments. It was not possible to bring uh, children to the uh, to the workplace, and they did not necessarily have childcare provisions there. Um, but in those small informal workplaces, mothers could bring their babies, breastfeed whenever they wanted, and staff maybe did not get you know the formal pay, but they were happier. And there are also those. This you know leads to those questions around sense of entitlement. You know, is there a difference between what different you know staff types, you know, if you want them, want to call them that, you know, re expect? And we'll also look at this more um, duration of this workshop. That's me almost finished at this stage because oh, what two minutes oh there you go um yeah so this is really building on what sue has said so far what i have said so far and this is about unpacking those different layers of context so you obviously have the statutory provision and you have the contextual factors they obviously including the employment characteristics and working for you know, a large firm small firm formal informal economy rural urban area and so forth and you also have the wider cultural context so this is about societal views on the role of women as mothers and workers but also on fathers um yeah men as fathers and workers and these factors in turn influence the workplace culture particularly in small firms it's very important um, what your owner, what, what the manager of the organization thinks about it, the owner of the organization thinks, and that will influence the whole workplace culture and what people think they can ask for. And it also influences employees' sense of entitlement, as I just mentioned. So this is really about what they feel they can ask for, and that will differ on, obviously, if they are 
having a permanent contract or if they're in quite atypical, you know, precarious employment. And this is something that we'll, yeah, that you use really for, for the rest of this workshop. But I'll give you more examples this afternoon. So thank you very much.